Um, I'm, my name is Abby Cohen. I'm a senior associate at the Data Quality Campaign, and I'm super excited to be joined by our expert panelists. Um, we have Sarah Delano from the Louisiana Department of Education, um, as well as Tina Dimit Salinas and Emily Fox, who are joining us from the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, so a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Everyone uh, joining us today is muted, but if you have questions, please feel free to chat those to us using the chat box. We've left a good amount of time at the end of the webinar for questions from the audience. So we'll be compiling those over the course of the next um, hour and we'll, we'll make sure that we get to as many as possible. Um, and with that, I'm going to kick us off with um, putting this conversation within a little bit of context. If you are on DQC's um, email list or you joined us two weeks ago, you know that we are in the midst of a three-part webinar series, uh, all focused on educator pipeline issues and the role of data in helping us address um, a variety of different questions that we have. And la or two weeks ago, we had a wonderful conversation around the value of connecting supply and demand data. Um, and today we're really gonna dig into the value of, of data and helping us address questions on um, the equitable distribution of teachers and also di diversifying the educator pipeline. Now, neither of these conversations is particularly new. We've been talking about this since at least 2001 with No Child Left Behind, um, when there were requirements for states to um, submit reports and, and um, plans for ensuring that students were not disproportionately being taught by out of field or ineffective teachers. Um, similar requirements have stayed in the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, and we also know though that as these conversations have continued and evolved, um, that part of having a high quality teacher workforce um, is, is making sure that that um, workforce is diverse and really represents the students that, that our teachers are teaching. And right now that's not really the case. We know that nationally, 20% of teachers are minorities compared to more than half of students. Um, and we don't necessarily have a consistent picture across states or within states of who our teachers are and where they are going. A new report from the Albert Schenker Institute found that while most states are collecting sort of basic demographic data about our teachers, um, few of them are making them public, that information publicly available on their state website. Um, and so while that information exists at, at sort of a basic level, you have to either jump through a number of hurdles to get that information, sometimes being required to pay for it. Um, and, and so that doesn't exactly make it accessible. And so as policymakers and advocates, we think it's really important that we push beyond just collecting data and thinking about what is the other information we should be um, uh, pairing that with, what's the other contextual information that helps us really understand what that data is telling us, and then most importantly, who are we sharing it back with, who needs it to make informed policy decisions. Because at the end of the day, understanding who our teachers are and where they are going is the only way that we can ensure that we have a diverse and learner-ready uh, teaching force. And it's really the only way we can answer important questions that we have about how we are achieving those goals. Questions like, you know, which education preparation programs are producing successful, high quality, diverse teachers, um, which districts are doing the best job at retaining those teachers. And so if we don't have that information, we can't answer those questions and we ultimately are, are not going to be able to achieve our goals. So with that, I um, am really excited to dig into today's conversation about the unique role that the state plays in doing this work. Um, so at this point, I'm going to take uh, turn it over to Sarah. Um, who's going to uh, kick us off by telling us a little bit about the work that she is doing in her state. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, my name is Sarah. I work with the Louisiana Department of Education. And what I would like to talk through with everyone this afternoon is just to share with you some of the work that we're doing in Louisiana to share a suite of workforce data, both with school system leaders, with school leaders, as well as with teacher preparation providers. So we began this work back in 2015-16. Um, one piece of context that I, I'll provide first is that in Louisiana, we really collect a wealth of information from our school systems. Um, we have a data system called the Profile for Educational Personnel that has been in place actually for a few decades. And this is a place where school systems provide us with employment data. Um, they began a providing 
effectiveness data for teachers once we had a statewide evaluation system for teachers in place, um, which was beginning in 2012. Um, we have salary data, and we are actually in a place in Louisiana where not only do we have all of this data about our current workforce, but we are also able to connect that data um, with the program completer data from our teacher preparation providers. So I think that we are in a very good place um, to provide a lot of information back to school systems. However, having said that, um, you know, the employment data, for example, in particular, and the certification data is information um, that we've collected for many years, but we had never reported it back to school systems. So beginning in the 2015-16 academic year, we developed what's called an educator workforce report. And this is a suite of data that gives school system leaders um, an overview of the important of data around the important decisions they are charged with making. And so we had it organized around um, who are they recruiting into their system? So which teacher preparation providers are they working with to meet their needs? Uh, we provide data around where are your highest needs in your workforce? So where, in which schools do you see that you have the highest percentage of out of field or uncertified teachers? What are the certification areas where you really need the most teachers? Um, we also have data that we're providing around once teachers are in your system, which teachers need the most support. So when we're looking at their effectiveness ratings, which teachers are we seeing um, that could use professional development? Also, which teachers um, are have highly effective ratings and how is it um, that you could think about perhaps expanding their impact? Um, we also have data around um, with the teachers in your system, who is leaving, why are they leaving, and then equity data. So we provided this um, information, um, we've provided it for three years now. When we first provided it, um, it was only to our superintendents and um, we gave it as a flat PDF for them. Um, we had that for two years and then this past year we actually moved to an online platform which I'm going to show you um, and actually can you see my screen now do we yep okay so um, I think hold on okay so um, starting this last academic year we thought it would, was very important for us to move the workforce data that we've been reporting into a comprehensive system. This is our um, secure portal that you're actually seeing right now, which provides school systems with a suite of data around um, the academic performance in their school systems, um, the early childhood data, their career data um, for our Jumpstart Pathways, which is for career and technical education. And then we also have all of the workforce data here. And so this is really the one-stop shop for school systems. They can come to this system and see all of this data in one place. And so you can see here um, the different sections that we have for our school systems. And so we have it organized around recruitment and hiring, evaluating results, comp compensation, retention, and then equity. Um, if we go into the overview section, this provides information around um, the, the workforce needs in school systems. And we really are trying to draw attention to the workforce needs in our persistently struggling schools. And so that's the data that you're seeing here. And then I'm not going to go into all of the sections, but I do just want you to see that um, what we found most helpful in terms of organizing this data is if we organize the data around a set of important questions. And so for each of the sections, um, there are questions that we ask school system, um, that we have displayed here so that as school systems are reviewing the information, they can really think about, um, you know, what is the data telling us? And then, you know, what can we do about it? So 
with that piece, one of the things that I think is very important is as we were rolling out the data, we wanted to make sure, you know, not only that it's available in an accessible format, but also that we are supporting school systems in reviewing it. And so one of the ways that we've done this is every year when we release the data, our field teams go out and have individual conversations with each school system. As they're having these conversations, they are organizing those conversations around these key questions. And then we also have a companion discussion guide whereby school systems um, can think about if they're seeing, for example, that, um, which you know we do see in Louisiana, that let's say that many of their highly effective and most experienced teachers are in their highest performing schools, and you have a um, in your lower performing schools and your persistently struggling schools, you have teachers who tend to be inexperienced. Then what do you do about that? So what are some strategies um, that you could utilize to actually change that current state? And so the discussion guide um, also includes strategies and tools and resources so that school systems, once they've reviewed the data, can come up with their plan. Um, and so as the network teams have these conversations, they also work with school systems to build out a plan um, for how to address the workforce challenges um, that they're facing. Um, and then the one, oh, actually, should I stop here? I don't want to go over on time. Yeah, I think because you're digging into some some great stuff um, that I think we'll be able to dig into on a couple other questions. Um, yeah. But I did want to say, and, and we will talk a little bit more about this, two, two things that jump out to me are um, the framing of the data around questions. I think that can be really helpful. We do a lot of work on, on um, K-12 school report cards that the states are putting out. and that's often something we encourage states to think about is organizing data that way because people will often come to a report or a website with a question, right? They're not coming necessarily with a really specific data point that they're seeking out. They have a, a broader question. Um, and then also the just the focus on use that it's of course a hugely important first step to make the data available, but then also how do we think about doing it in a way um, where people know how to use it and they feel supported on how to use it. So. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, Tina and Emily, do you want to talk a little bit about your work in Illinois? I think you might be muted on your end. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay. So I actually was just thanking you, Sarah, for, you know, starting us off. Illinois shares some of the same um, strategies around collection and dissemination, um, and then some that are different as well. Much like Louisiana, we've had an ongoing report card, a K-12 report card that uh, provides in an aggregate level uh, the demographics of the student population as well as teachers. And then uh, we do have uh, a dashboard, much like you just showed, that we've been using called our Ed360 dashboard. I apologize, I, I didn't have an opportunity to bring that up for you to look at it, but I'm happy to show if anyone's interested um, outside the webinar. So the dashboard is for, you know, it's a uh, secure access for superintendents, hiring managers, and it has, it links our uh, licensure system, which includes professional development, retention, employment, our employment system, um, as well as our student information system. So uh, that dashboard provides a one-stop shop for hiring managers, districts, and so forth to identify their workforce needs in their district. You know, I, I was excited to be on this webinar specifically to talk to you about our PEP initiative, as well as our, our dealer toward diverse and learner ready teachers initiative and what we're working doing in that space, which is why I have my colleague Emily Fox here. So in 2015, uh, Illinois embarked on a initiative to reform teacher preparation, reporting, and data collection for accountability, continuous improvement, and transparency. And so um, prior to that, there was real there was there wasn't a reporting mechanism for the public to um, or 
uh, districts or hiring managers to determine where their teachers or what where their completers um, were uh, graduating from. And so our Partnership for Educator Preparation Initiative allows us the opportunity to follow uh, you know, candidates from K-12 Illinois schools through teacher preparation programs and then into the field of education. We uh, track these trends over uh, three years. We're in a second year of a two-year pilot. Uh, some would consider it a three-year pilot because we did a mini pilot, uh, which was an optional opt-in opportunity for um, uh, institutions of higher education. So it's really going to provide a, a broad landscape of data across our state on where our um, candidates are going in comparison to our highest needs, much like you talked, Sarah. Um, not only high need areas, but high need subject areas, or high need regions of the state, but high need subject areas as well. And, and then also, you know, our outsourcing of teachers as well. We, um, we will track that in a report that will be publicly available in 2020. And then one related initiative that we're working on, as Tina had mentioned, is our Diverse and Learner Ready Teacher Initiative. Uh, we were lucky enough to be chosen by CCSSO as one of eight states to start on this initiative, which is great for Illinois because we have two million students, over half of them are non-white, and our teacher demographics do not reflect that. Our teacher workforce is about 83% white. So um, some of the initiatives that we're working on as part of that work is we're planning to being a group of stakeholders that are going to help us think through some um, culturally responsive teaching standards that we're going to implement for all of our preparation programs. They're also going to serve a role as part of the PEP work that Tina mentioned in that they're going to help the institutions of higher education develop recruitment and retention plans for diverse educators. And then finally, a third initiative that they're going to help us with is a um, media campaign in the state to elevate the teaching profession. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I am really just love hearing how different states are tackling similar challenges. And, and like you said, Tina, often there's some overlap in strategies, but there's also gonna be some differences just given different state needs. Um, and so I, one commonality that I hear is that this work didn't like start yesterday, right? This is something that as a state, you all have been thinking about over multiple years and sort of your thinking on that has evolved, obviously. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit, sort of at the highest level, why you feel that in your respective state agency, this has become a priority. Why, sort of what is the, um, what's the impetus to do this work beyond, uh, you know, being federally required or sort of having a really niche uh, goal around um, teacher equity or equitable distribution from a state perspective, why is this something that states should be engaging in? Tina, you want to talk? Sure. I know it's hard on webinar. So Illinois, not like on other states or even the nation, is experiencing the teacher workforce issue and overlaid with that is the equity issue. Um, we've had an overwhelming voice for a need for actionable information in the hands of, the, of those that are making hiring decisions. Illinois is very diverse um, and often reflects the diversity of the nation, just in Illinois as a state. It's comprised of nearly 860 districts, each with varying levels of capacity or human resource per personnel to analyze workforce data and identify trends and trends in diversity. Therefore, these uh, workforce reports that we're developing have the potential to not only significantly improve districts recruiting and hiring, but also to encourage mutually beneficial EPP and district partnerships. Districts will be more informed regarding uh, EPP performance and more deliberate in their partnership with high performing EPPs. We think that the effort will continue to build the interest of hiring managers and EPPs, as well as motivate EPPs to improve their programs School boards and district leaders will have ready access to information letting them know if they're attracting and retaining teachers from high quality programs. Likewise, teacher preparation programs will be able to know where they rank among other competing programs. 
Great. And I would also mention in our state's focus on equity, um, stemming from our ESSA plan to a law that was passed last year that um, requires evidence-based funding, which changes our entire state structure on how the majority of state funds are distributed to districts, really has put an emphasis on making sure that all students uh, receive the education that they need, which ties into why we started the Diverse and Learner Ready Teacher Initiative. That's great, right? This is this is not just an isolated project, but it's very much related to the success of the system overall and meeting sort of larger statewide goals. Sarah, how about in Louisiana? Um, I would say in Louisiana, um, well, one of the themes that I'll pick, pick up on from Illinois um, that is similar in Louisiana, but I would say also different um, in a way is, um, the emphasis on really trying to build a school system that is cohesive from K-12 all the way through our higher education system that prepares teachers. And so we're really trying to think of our system, and, and actually in Louisiana, it's, it's really from early childhood, you know, through higher education, really trying to think of our system as one cohesive system instead of three separate pieces. And so one of the things that I think might be a bit different in Louisiana, perhaps, than in Illinois, is that in Louisiana, um, most of the teachers who work in our state, um, it's actually more than 70% of teachers who work here were prepared here. And so this is really a huge opportunity for us to really think about um, the importance of educator preparation, um, both in terms of you know, what are we teaching our new teachers and then how are they being deployed within our system? And so as we're thinking about, you know, trying to create this one cohesive system that's really meeting the needs of our K-12 students, it is incredibly important for us to be very clear about where is it that needs are being well met and where do we have gaps? And then once we've identified those, what are the specific strategies we are going to employ to address that? And so um, I will say, you know, one of the things that we learned through a survey that we conducted um, with educators, school system leaders, teacher preparation providers back in 2014, um, that was, I would say, you know, concerning is that we had almost half of new teachers saying that they did not feel fully prepared on their first day. And so we were thinking about how is it that we can really um, strengthen the partnerships between teacher preparation providers and school systems. And one of the first things that needs to happen there is everybody in the system needs to understand the current state. And so getting out this data was really important to us in terms of opening new conversations between school systems and teacher preparation providers around what's working well in the partnership, where is it that school systems need more teachers, how could preparation providers support them in that. Um, so I, I do think um, that in that we, in, in terms of getting this data out, we are really seeing it as a huge opportunity um, to open different kinds of conversations around how to strengthen the workforce in, in this um, we are being very intentional and are very interested in making sure that this is not going only to our school systems, but it's opening up conversations with teacher preparation providers. That's great. And I, um, I appreciate both, both of you talking about the importance of sort of engaging everybody who's involved in a teacher's career, right, from the very beginning with their educator preparation program through to whichever district or school that they're that they're working in. And that is something we at DQC think a lot about if we have to, especially on, on um, we think about teachers and our, our teacher workforce, that we have to start think, thinking about it more from a systems level instead of thinking, okay, this is a higher ed issue when they're being prepared and then it becomes a K-12 issue when they come into um, a district school. But this is all of our issues all of the time because these these topics are obviously very seriously connected. And if we don't if we don't start having those conversations across sectors and, and sharing information across sectors, it's going to be really difficult to address these issues. So building off of that, um, and Sarah, I'll, I'll 
throw this one to you first. Um, how how do you envision or how do you see this data being used um, to inform action, especially when it comes to achieving or achieving goals and having uh, stronger conversations around issues with teacher distribution, uh, uh, sorry, distribution of high quality teachers, but then also um, diversifying the teacher pipeline. Um, how do you see that being used or, or want that to be used to drive action? Um, yes, yeah, so one of the things um, that I would like to talk through, which is actually new for us this year, is um, kind of as, um, as sort of like phase two for ESSA, one of the things that we are doing in Louisiana is we are asking every single school system to provide one consolidated plan to us for their funding, both um, for grant funding and then also for federal flow through dollars, so Title I, Title II, REAP. So they actually have one consolidated application um, with five priorities. They are going to be submitting plans to us around those five priorities for their persistently struggling schools and also for their urgent intervention schools. And these are schools where there's at least one subgroup, subgroup of students, so English language learners, perhaps students with special needs who are struggling. And so we really have an effort here, you know, for the first time, whereas before there might have been 20 or 30 different grant applications that school systems were submitting to us at various points in time. They have one application that needs to include their plan for the whole school year across five areas. One of the key areas for this plan is talent and your workforce development. And so one of the things um, that school systems, just to give you a very concrete example, we see that in our persistently struggling schools, um, the teachers who are in those schools may need more support. They may, they are most likely less experienced than colleagues in other schools. And so as part of the plans, school systems will need to speak to how are they building a cadre of mentor teachers, of content leaders within their persistently struggling schools um, to support new teachers and then also to support all teachers in effective curriculum implementation. And so in kind of creating this talent pipeline in struggling schools and really asking school systems to commit to having mentor teachers, content leaders, for example, in those schools, that's also a way because um, in, in Louisiana, if you're a mentor teacher, um, you actually receive additional funding. So it's a way for um, us to kind of move the needle in terms of equitable distribution of teachers. Um, so that's one thing I would point out. I would say that in terms of the diversity of the workforce, this is something that's newer in terms of a focus for Louisiana. We are also involved in this SSO work with um, Illinois, so I'm very excited about that. We are just now this year um, beginning to report out on um, the diversity of the workforce um, kind of in this your site. We do have it in our public site, but it is something um, that we're, we're getting into more detail. Great, thank you. How about um, Tina and Emily? What, um, how do you envision this being used or see it being used in terms of driving action um, across the state? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, so I think, you know, data in, in, for Illinois empowers school districts and I think higher ed to not only reflect on their partnerships, but also um, to, am I on mute again? No, no, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to inform their hiring decisions. The, the data that we've been talking about from our Partnership for Educator Preparation uh, initiative has actually ignited a partnership initiative called our 
continuous improvement communities of practice. This initiative is a cohort um, or a pod, what we're calling them, of uh, district and higher ed leaders that come together and talk about two things. One, just about their partnership and how they can move using our Ed First scale from a, you know, kind of a initial um, intimate part or initial um, uh, partnership to more of an intimate partnership. So moving from a handshake to a huddle mentality. The second thing that the uh, CICPs work towards is a common problem of practice. For example, in this initiative, um, one of our uh, EPPs who produces the most, most teachers for a particular district, they have huddled around a problem of practice around teacher diversity because they've um, projected that based on retires and retirees and so forth, that their um, diversity is actually going to decrease. And so uh, together, they've not only um, implemented a recruitment plan at the EPP, but also the district happens to be uh, the highest producer of candidates in their preparation program. So it seems like it's coming in full circle. So the district's actually um, uh, partnering with the EPP to develop a curricular inclusion for teacher, um, a teacher preparation course that would start high school students thinking about teaching as a career earlier in the K-12 setting. So the data that they've used from our Partnership for Educator Preparation Program, the data we collected for higher ed, as well as the district data that's provided, finally is kind of overlaid together where they can not only look at historical trends, but also forecast or predict, um, you know, the opportunity to place in supports and some of these strategies and different initiatives to support their continued teacher pipeline. That's great. And not to layer in an, an, an additional comp complex issue, but I love the sort of workforce piece of that too, of engaging high school students in thinking about, you know, what careers are possible when they graduate and sort of getting that mindset going um, that tees up a lot of really good conversations. Um, so as you think about the, the work that you've done and knowing that there are um, state colleagues on the, on the webinar who might be thinking about this, do you have recommendations of the types of data that uh, folks should, could, should think about either collecting or sharing? Um, and feel free, you know, it can sort of be broad buckets or if you have specific indicators that you think are super helpful, um, both when we think about the, the diversity question and I think we can take a pretty broad definition of what we mean when we say diversity, right? Um, so both thinking about that issue, but then also thinking about the um, distribution. Are, are there particular pieces of information that you all have found to be helpful? I'm gonna idle to Sarah because we we are in the early stages of our indicators. Uh, so we're currently collecting them. We've collected them for just a year. We're going on our second year of collection. So I, I do have some thoughts, but I'd love Sarah for you to share. Yeah, um, I can frame this in terms of where we've seen the most traction in the field in terms of um, dis like actions, in terms of decision making and where we've seen the most movement. So I think the first thing is um, we have the, the one section um, that gets at the workforce needs for a school system, both for the entire school system, but then for each school within it. And one of the things that we've done with the data is we've said, this is where you have the highest workforce need in terms of, let's say, certification areas. So in your system, we're seeing that perhaps you have the highest need for middle and secondary math teachers. And then we've paired that data with, let's look at, with your teacher preparation providers, the new graduates that they're sending to you, are they actually in your highest need areas? And so we've drawn attention to, if this is your highest need area, but then you see that your teacher preparation providers are perhaps mostly sending you elementary candidates, then what's the next step here? And so with that particular data point, we've seen um, that teacher preparation providers and school systems are actually developing MOUs where school systems are asking preparation providers to commit to sending them graduates in their highest need areas. 
Um, the other thing that we've seen is if teacher preparation providers are saying, well, you know, I'd love to send you this person, I just don't have a math teacher. We're also seeing that with the data, school systems are able to say, well, I actually have uncertified people in this area. I'm gonna give you their names. Can you prepare them? Because they're already in front of students. They need to go through a post-baccalaureate preparation program. So we've seen a lot of traction there. So I think really drawing attention to the pipeline and the need has been very important. And then the second thing, this, this might be unique to Louisiana, I'm not sure, but um, so in Louisiana, you know, we have a value added um, system for our teachers. And um, while um, this information has been available to school systems for quite some time, we're actually displaying it in a way where they can see their teachers who are who can have the consistently highly effective results, so over a three-year period, as well as teachers who have had consistently ineffective results. And by displaying the information in that way, um, we've seen that school systems have made some bit, pretty big changes in terms of thinking about, wow, my teachers who are really knocking it out of the park, let's, I know who they are now, most definitely. And so what, how can I, um, basically, how can I utilize them differently? And then for my teachers who are struggling, really thinking about why is it that they're struggling? Is it perhaps this is not the subject area they should be teaching and really coming up with a plan um, to work with those educators? And so those are two areas where we've seen a lot of traction. I do think, especially if you're first getting started in this, just pairing, just getting out that workforce need data has been very impactful because we've seen um, that as school systems were looking at this, it gave them greater precision into knowing the, the specific needs for each of their schools. Thank you. Great. That's great to hear, Sarah. You know, the two that I had thought of initially was for, you know, the workforce data or where the highest needs are in the state, specifically Illinois, and, uh, you know, a teacher workforce crisis, if you will. We just embarked or just concluded a year long study on our teacher workforce around four central areas uh, pipeline, recruitment, retention licensure and preparation and now developing recommendations um, around policy actions uh, for us to support you know our workforce crisis um, as far as what data should states consider including I you know I absolutely believe in the workforce data so identifying the need and then um, you know supporting those partnerships to develop a pipeline to satisfy that need. The other uh, piece of data that I think is influential and, off, and a deficit actually in Illinois. So if there's anyone on the webinar that's kind of in the same place as us would be that outcome performance data. Fortunately in Illinois, we uh, do not have a common evaluation tool, nor do we have a value add or student outcome um, metric that's reported to the state uh, districts and um, you know, schools can choose um, the option for which they want to evaluate their teachers and measure their students. And that has been um, hard as we try to look at the state, you know, holistically as well. So that's definitely a data element that I would continue to advocate for. We're here um, in Illinois trying to be as innovative as we can around how we're able to define effectiveness um, of teachers with the absence of those types of measures um, and then as well as um, I would just you know I think entrance data for candidates or for um, teachers you know where they completed their programs and so forth I think there's a robust amount of information so being able to slice that data and analyze it in a meaningful way uh, to those that are receiving it hiring managers um, even just principals so that they know um, you know, it's easily accessible, if you will. Uh, so other data that states should consider. Emily, did you? Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention with the PEM data is that uh, a, a new thing that Tina and our team are working on is uh, showing IAGs where all of their graduates are going. So that's a really helpful tool to help them determine what districts they should reach out to to form partnerships. 
It's great. Thank you. And, and Tina, you bring up a very good point about, I think, um, I fall into this trap sometimes working at sort of the national level of, well, we just have to just like have this data and connect it. And, you know, but there's these de really sort of foundational definitional issues that we have to sort of work through before we can answer the questions that we really want to answer. And so we advocate a lot for states, state leaders across agencies to identify those key questions that we have, uh, you know, whatever the topic might be, but in this particular case about our teachers. And if we're working in, you know, to your point, if you're working to um, improve our pipeline of high quality teachers, we also need to be clear on what that means, um, which in some cases is easier said than done, but that is uh, really important um, conversation to have at, at the front end of this um, because, you know, just like you said, it's hard, it's hard to do the work on the back end if you haven't sort of figured out those building block pieces on the front end. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, so the last question I have for, for both states is really about why, why the state? What is it about the unique position that you all occupy that allows you to do this work to connect these at times disparate um, interest groups and get folks to commit to um, having these conversations and, and using this data. Why is why should the state take this on? I'm happy to start. Um, there are two things that came to mind right away. I think that um, states are oftentimes uniquely positioned to do this just because of the data systems that we have. So um, we are in a position where we can you know, collect employment data. We have data about our teacher preparation providers, effectiveness data. And so we are able to collect, aggregate, analyze, and give back this data to school systems in a way that um, school systems themselves just aren't as easily able to do. Um, I think that's one thing. Another thing, um, and I think this does vary from state to state, but I know, um, so in Louisiana, for example, um, we are uniquely positioned in that we have the lever of accountability both for our K-12 schools, um, and then our board also approves all of the teacher preparation providers um, that offer initial certification in the state. And so, you know, with, with that um, in, in particular, we have a new accountability system right now where 25% um, of, of a rating that teacher preparation providers will begin to receive is based upon the extent to which they are meeting work, Louisiana's workforce needs, both in terms of our highest need certification areas, um, as well as meeting needs in our rural schools. And so I think that if you kind of take these two pieces together in terms of the, um, you know, the accountability piece and then also the ability of states um, to get all of this information together and um, provide it back to um, school systems, teacher preparation providers in a meaningful way, um, I think that we're able to, to just do that in a way um, that other organizations are not as well positioned to do. Yeah, the capacity piece is a huge part of this. You know, in, in Illinois, we're devoutly committed as a state agency to the children of Illinois, and so ensuring that one of those commitments includes ensuring that our students are taught by a highly effective and diverse teachers and leaders. And in doing that, you know, our, our teacher demographics nowhere reflect, like Emily said, our student demographics. And we believe that it's the state's role to not only disseminate appetizing data uh, that's useful, meaningful, and actionable, but to continue to charge or engage districts, EPPs, um, other state leaders with intentional plans to diversify the teacher workforce or the teacher pipeline in Illinois. Um, you had mentioned this, Abby, um, but Illinois is um, a state of task forces. And uh, we actually, um, you know, appreciate that title, if you will, only because we believe that the, the boots on the ground uh, should be the loudest voices. So when we're, they're asking about what sort of data they would need, I, we believe that it's the state role, state's role to provide that data to them. 
Awesome. I could not have said that better myself. And I, I think oftentimes missing from this conversation is asking the actual people who are going to be using the data um, what they need and in what way is it most accessible and usable. And in our webinar last week, we had someone from the Kentucky Center for Statistics and that she spoke a lot about Kentucky's focus on bringing people together and asking them, what do you need? How can we meet your needs? And I think that that sort of um, customer service is definitely not the right word, but having more of that mindset of like a service oriented perspective of that, you know, as the role of the state, of course, there's always going to be an accountability role. Part of it is building that capacity and meeting people's needs. And I think it just becomes this virtuous cycle of when people feel like they're actually getting support, they're actually getting the information they care about, they're going to be way more likely to use it and to ask for more and to sort of more deeply engage in the work than if they feel like it's just sort of compliance activity. So um, so thank you both for, for those great points. Uh, at this point, we're going to open it up to Q&A. Right now, I have um, one question that I'm going to share with both of you. And it's um, just, will the data that you all talk about, what level of that data is available, is it available publicly beyond um, sharing it with superintendents and teacher prep programs? So um, our answer is oh, uh, Quite simple. Our K-12 data uh, is available right now, as well as our supply and demand data. We do a some supply and demand static report every three years, but there is an um, annual uh, report that's uh, dynamic, so it's filterable and such uh, on the Illinois State Board of Education's website if you search supply and demand. Um, in 2020, beginning in 2020, will be uh, the higher ed report cards, if you will. So much like our K-12 report cards for each school in Illinois, Every uh, Illinois institution um, or college will have a report card. And we haven't decided on a name, but that's what we're calling it right now. <laughs> um, yeah, so in Louisiana, we have a state, um, both a state level workforce report and regional workforce reports that are available on our website. And then in terms of the date, those are produced annually. In terms of the data that goes to school systems, we actually give this data at the parish level, the school level, and then down to the teacher level for our school system leaders and principals. So. And then we'll also have a report, a report card, a performance profile um, that will be publicly available um, for teacher preparation providers uh, starting in 2020. Oh, wow. Awesome. Were there any other questions? I, that was our, our one question for today. So I just, I really want to thank um, all three of you for joining us for a great conversation. And um, uh, I also wanted to tee up that our last webinar of the series um, is coming up in two weeks which of course now my screen went blank, um, using data to understand the issues facing your state's educator workforce. So we will have um, two panelists here talking about the role of or value of sort of different types of data, in, including more qualitative data in understanding the teacher experience and how that can help us with questions around um, recruitment and retention. So please um, keep a lookout for registration information. It'll be on um, Halloween, October 31st at 12 p.m. Um, Eastern time. And um, with that, I will say thank you to everyone for joining us. And, you know, please never hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.